I'm so excited to be here. I haven't been in Nashville for like 20 years. I'm embarrassed to say something has happened here. <laughs> it's a tad bigger. And Parnassus, I had never been to Parnassus. And I met Bear the dog today, and I am now fully convinced every bookstore in America should have a resident dog or two. Not bookstore cats are fine, but you need a dog there. I just, oh wow, I, what an amazing bookstore and what an amazing library, it's gorgeous. You guys are really spoiled, I'm telling you. So here's what we're gonna do. I am going to um, give you sort of a, a mini version of my school presentation and kind of whip through some topics. It'll probably take about 20, 25 minutes and then we'll do some questions and then we'll sign some books. So if you think of a good question while I'm talking, just pop it in your brain and we can uh, talk about it more at the end. I'm gonna talk to you about what it's like to be an alien and what it's like to be the last member of your species and what it's like to be a writer who makes a ton of mistakes because I know a lot about that. So, and I'm also, going to pick your brains for a moment. I promise it won't be too painful. I have um, something I want you guys to try to do. I have written like over 150 books, well over, I've lost track, and that's because many of them are eminently forgettable. But um, many, 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 many series, and a lot of ghostwriting. But the one thing I've loved doing is making stuff up. This is my job. I make stuff up and I wear sweatpants to work. I am paid to be a liar and a slob. It is the best job in the world. I'm not kidding. And uh, many years ago, my husband and I did this series called Animorphs about kids who could turn in animals. If you touch them, uh, an animal, you acquired their DNA and bam, you could be that animal for two hours. But the best part was we got to make up aliens and entire species. And this little blue guy is called an Andalite. He looks like a deer and he's harmless, except that he has a giant scorpion tail and he can kill anything. And our best villains were called Yerks. And Yerks are like, picture like gooey, slimy, wormy things. And they crawl into your ear hole and they wrap around your brain and take it over. So that is what I do for a living. And that is why when I went to write Endling, I knew I wanted to create some new species. Endling is based on a word. And obviously, E-N-D-L-I-N-G, but you won't find it in most dictionaries yet. Sadly, it is a word we've come to need because we are going through something called the Sixth Great Extinction. And you know, we lost dinosaurs a long time ago. Well. We had nothing to do with that because we weren't around, but uh, we seem to be losing species at an unprecedented rate these days, and um, it seems to be entirely our fault. So there are lots of reasons, habitat, predation, and oh, pollution and global warming and all kinds of things, but the net result is every now and then you end up with an endling. And an endling is the very last individual in a species or a subspecies. And when I heard this word, my daughter found it, actually. She was in high school. She was poking around online, probably not doing her homework. And she said, Mom, this is such a cool thing and, and so poignant and so bizarre. And I thought, wow, that would make a really interesting trilogy. And so I sold it to my publisher, and then I realized I had no plot. And I've been working on that ever since. But the first thing I had to do was create species. And I love dogs. Any dog people out here? I love cats. It's okay. But dogs are so funny and optimistic. And, you know, there's always another food bowl right around the corner. And I love them. So I decided to use my old dog, Goofy, who um, was a yellow lab. And I decided to improve upon him, and I created a dairn. And a dairn is basically this, goofy, plus a kangaroo pouch, because I knew I was going on these elaborate fantasy adventures. It, I didn't want a doggy backpack, so I decided we'll have a little pouch. You can carry your stuff there. Made Goofy stand upright, which for the artist turned out to be a major challenge, and uh, decided he could glide like a flying squirrel because why not? I'm creating the species. I gave him fingers because that is the one downside of being a dog. You do not have opposable thumbs. 
And lo and behold, I had a Darren, and my Darren's name is Bix. And Bix is tiny. She's the runt of the litter. She's little bitty. Nobody thinks she can do anything. And she turns out to be the endling Darren. Then I thought, I need a best friend, right? So I created a Wobbick. And a Wobbick is basically a fennec fox with even bigger ears, it can do all kinds of crazy tricks, and with three tails, and it's silvery blue, and incredibly brave. And that was species number two. Bix's best friend is Tobble the Wobbick. Now, when I do this, it takes me, you know, sometimes it'll take me 10 hours, sometimes it'll take me 10 days. I've been known to take 10 months when I'm working out details. Guess how much time I'm going to give you guys? 10 seconds. <laughs> but I know you can do this because I know you wouldn't be here if you didn't have great imaginations and probably you like to read and probably I can steal some really good ideas. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you 10 seconds and the, the grown-ups can hang out and do this too if they want, but this is really for the kids. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to pick three characteristics of a species that you just love. So maybe you like cats but you want to improve on them, so you're going to give them eagle wings, and maybe you want them a little more ferocious, so you give them shark teeth. Or maybe you want to work with monsters, or aliens, or vampires, or unicorns. It doesn't have to be a mammal. It could be a tree. It could be a reptile. I mean, it's whatever you like. And I want you to pick three cool things, and then you can tell us what species you've come up with, and I'm hoping they're good so I can use them in book three. Okay, you have 10 seconds. Tick tock, no pressure. Think hard. It's not as easy as it looks, is it? <laughs> so did any, anybody, any kids or adults think of a cool species? Anybody? Oh, come on, I know there's one up there. Okay, in the white shirt, can you, can you yell it? And you can tell us, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell them that I have some microphones after this. It's the species of shoe <laughs> <laughs> and it's part dog. Dog. It has, e it, it has eagle wings and it can turn invisible. Turning invisible? I forgot to tell you about powers. <laughs> powers are so important. One of the cool things that like dares can do, and this is really helpful. And you can give, it's like, you know, pick a Marvel Universe kind of power. You can do anything you want here. Um, I decided Darren's can tell when people are lying. And I know that sounds, think, think about this for a minute. If I gave you a little chip and you could put it in your brain and you could tell when your friends were lying, how many of you would think that was pretty cool? Raise your hand. Yeah. Okay. What if I gave that chip to your mom and dad? Hi. Yeah. This is Bix's problem. Being a Darren is both really cool and really dangerous. So powers are good too. Okay, does anybody else have another species? Do you want to pick somebody? Do I? Yeah, because you you're, uh, you're running around. You're empowered with a mic now, aren't you? I, well, I am. <laughs> okay, Excellent. Else. Yeah, why don't you pick somebody? Um. A wolf with really long ears Ooh. and um, is light blue. Oh, I want to see that. That would be a great character. I could totally do a book around that. That's excellent. And that would probably be, well, you know, an interesting thing. You have to decide, is this an evil character or is this a good guy? So that's another thing to think about. Who else has one? Oh, look at all these good ideas. I love it. <laughs> it's a good guy, and he's a tiger Ooh. with gecko-like hands so he can go upside down <gasps> and oh. cheetah speed. Oh, my gosh. See, I told you. How can you do this in 10 seconds? It really bothers me at some level because <laughs> it takes me forever. But how cool would that be? And, you know, something you should do. What's really fun is you draw your species, even if you don't like to draw, because it gives you a sense of what they'd actually look like. How about another one? Uh, um, a furry fanged fish who has the ability <laughs> to lure insects into its mouth. Ooh, that's excellent. Oh, I love that. Are you a writer? That's very imaginative. I love that. How about we do two more? Okay. I'm going to the other side because I'm... 
It's um, it's funny because it's as you do steps. it, you start adding little bits and pieces. You start out with those three traits, and then you've got more to add. Yeah. Um, a rabbit that breathes fire and has huge ears. <laughs> a rabbit that breathes fire? I love that. So that could be cute and cuddly or really scary. And that's really fun with your characters, too. Sometimes you want a little mix of both. Who else has one? Oh, I love all these good ideas. And if, we, if you don't get a chance to share your ideas, you want to do it at the end when we're talking, that would be great, because I love hearing these. What would you come up with? Uh, a creature that has the shape of a gorilla with a turtle shell on its back, and it's uh, has a super strength, I guess. Oh my gosh, that's mm -hmm. so cool! And I'm a big gorilla fan, so uh, I love that. You know, um, the t turtle shell is a nice embellishment. I'm trying to imagine that. Uh, this is so great, and it was fun, wasn't it? And it was pretty easy. And you think you're done, don't you? But you're not because you have to decide the name for your species, and then you have a million questions to ask. Does it have philosophy? Does it have religion? Does it have government? Can it breathe air? Can it go under the water? Where does it live? And this is a big one. You have to create your fantasy world. So in my case, it was pretty easy. I came up with something called Nadara. Now, my maps do not look like that map. And you, you make a very basic map, usually if you're an author, and then an illustrator comes along and makes it all pretty. But you notice on the left where it says Tara C. Tara is the name of my editor. My editor is the person who helps me make books. So you guys can use your own names. You could name a whole country after your best friend. You can put whatever you want in there. And then, think about this. Does it have volcanoes? Does it have um, oceans? What's the weather like? You've got all these weird things to think about. And before you know it, you've created an entire world. Now, I started out with animals. I love animals. I worked for a, a veterinarian in high school. I thought I wanted to be a vet. And basically, all I did was um, give cats baths, which is challenging, and pick up poop a lot, which is also challenging. And, uh, but I learned a lot about animals. And I still, to this day, I don't think I've written a book that didn't have animals in it. So I got... <laughs> Well into Endling before, I thought, oh, yeah, maybe I throw in some humans. And your worlds can be entirely full of humans, or they can be entirely full of animals, or entirely full of reptiles. It's your world. So think about that. Do you want humans? And are they good, or are they bad? In my case, I picked a little bit of both. And Renzo and Carol are good guys. Um, humans... In most of Nadara, however, are not so good. Renzo is a thief, and a good thief, but he's also a magician. And Kara is incredibly brave and powerful and amazing in a fight. And she's basically the person who holds this little family together. So at some point, you've got an ensemble, right? You've got your cast of characters. And when you're doing that, don't forget the bad guys. Don't forget your Darth Vader. You need somebody. You need a villain because stories are much more interesting with villains. And villains are fun to write. So I had Bix and Tobble and Kara and Renzo, and they head off to see if they can find any more Darns after Bix's entire pack is wiped out by soldiers. And she thinks... She's the last Darren on Earth. And there's, there is Bix with her mom just before the soldiers come. Um, the fact that Darrens have very soft, silky fur is one of the reasons they're coveted. But the fact that they can tell the truth makes them far more desirable to lots of not-so-nice people. They head off, and there's, uh, they run into some rather large snakes. There's Tobble up in the corner looking a little disturbed by the whole thing. They, weirdly enough, attend a funeral for a Darren. It happens to be Bix's. They meet uh, something called raptodons, these giant birds with huge wings. And by the end of the first book, they have created this little family, but they're not just looking for one Darren anymore. They are in the middle of a war between species. And then I moved on to my newest book. Because I am a moron, I decided it'd be really cute if I named the first book the last and the second book the first. And trust me, it really makes sense. Bix is the last of her species. She becomes the first to lead them into battle. 
And the final book is called The Only. And um, she becomes the only one who can save the entire land. However, it is confusing to everyone, particularly kids and booksellers, and I deeply regret my choice. I'm so sorry. So I'm going to tell you something now, and this is um, terribly embarrassing, and you won't hear it from most authors. I can almost guarantee it, and I prefer the adults not to listen. If you want to cover your ears, that's optional. This is between me and the kids. When I was your age, I really, really, really hated to read. And I, it may be that one or two of you in the audience is like me. Imagine most of you came because you really like books, or maybe your mom and dad dragged you here. That's an, also a possibility. But I was, I just thought it was so boring. Why would you want to read about made-up people? And um, I have a daughter who has dyslexia. For her, you know, reading is very challenging. If you have dyslexia, you can overcome it with really good teachers and and lots of work, but that wasn't my problem. I just thought it was boring. And then I found my best friend book. And I believe that Charlotte's Web was written just for me. Kate Camillo thinks it was written just for her, but she's wrong, it was written just for me. I love this book, you wanna know what's interesting? It's okay with me if you hated Charlotte's Web. You are entitled to your opinion. You don't like everybody in the world. You don't have to like every book either. Maybe your best friend book is gonna be a graphic novel. My daughter loves those. Or maybe it's going to be journalism, or maybe it's going to be um, poetry. Maybe your most favorite thing in the world is song lyrics. It doesn't have to be a classic book. It just has to be words that move you and change you. And for everybody out there, there is a best friend book. And you may have already found it, but if you haven't, and you're like me, I just want to tell you to hang in there. Because if you told me I'd be standing up here talking about 150 books I'd written, I would have said you were crazy when I was in fourth grade. I would have said, there is no way that is ever happening. And it just is about falling in love with books. And it takes, for some people, it takes a, little, a long time. Now, this is my official author photo. I encourage you to remember one thing. What do you think all that, that white stuff is? Anybody just yell it. What do you think that is? Yeah, so, so why would an author be surrounded by crumpled paper, do you think? Just yell it. Can you think of a reason? Why would I? Exactly. We have to rewrite. We make mistakes. It turns out, if you're a writer, you make a lot of mistakes. And it turns out also, if you're a human, you make a lot of mistakes. And I didn't realize that. I thought I had to be perfect. And I was really afraid to be a writer because it seemed like such a public way to fail. You know, I'm standing out here bearing my soul and people were going to laugh at me. And it took me a long time to get up the nerve. But once I realized writing is about rewriting and rewriting and rewriting, it started to get fun. So how many of you, raise your hand, have you ever had a, like a teacher hand back a paper and it has lots of red marks on it and you're like, oh man, I got to do this over again. Has that ever happened to any of you? Welcome to being a professional writer. That is my life. That is what I do every single day. I rewrite. I make mistakes. And the more you do it, believe it or not, the more fun it becomes. However, when I started, I was very nervous about becoming a writer. So first I became the world's worst waitress. And I'm a total klutz. And I got a degree in English and then went straight into waiting tables, which is a typical career trajectory. But... Um, in my case, it was not a good idea. And so one night, this is really true, I was carrying a tray and it had four huge strawberry milkshakes on it. And I walked up to a man and he was wearing, I'm not kidding, a totally white suit. And he had a white hat and white shoes and white socks. I don't know what his thing was, but naturally, you know what happened, right? Yeah, the milkshakes ended up on the man in the white suit, and he turned pink, and I turned red, and it was so humiliating. And I thought, you know what? If I'm going to be a lousy waitress, maybe I should just be a lousy writer. I mean, if I'm going to be embarrassed anyway, maybe, maybe I should give it a shot. So I became what's called a ghostwriter, and a ghostwriter doesn't have her name on the books. So there you see a series that women of a certain age may recall called Sweet Valley, Jessica and Elizabeth. Jessica was the evil twin. 
And um, dozens of us wrote those books. And my name was never on. I wrote 17 of those. And um, I started to learn how to make a story, even though my name wasn't really on it. Then I started writing for Disney. And I wrote so many Disney books. I wrote Little Mermaid and Aladdin and Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse and Goofy. Oh, I can't even tell you how many Donald Duck books I've written. And I learned more about writing, but my name still wasn't on the books. Then my husband and I did Animorphs, and there were 63 or four books in this series. We wrote about 40 of them. And this was back in the days when, and I don't know why they don't do this anymore. Um, there was a book a month for, for a lot of series. So remember Goosebumps and Babysitter's Club and all these books came out every month. And kids loved it because you got to, if you fell in love with a book, oh man, it was there every month with a new one. So we wrote a book every single month. We had a new baby and we were very tired. But it was a great way to learn how to write. Now my name is sort of on there. It says K.A. Applegate. And do you know why they did that? They did not think that boys would read books written by a woman. And I think they're crazy, and I wish I'd fought that. But at the time, I was just grateful to be published. So my name was almost there. And then I decided to write what I called real books. And my real books had a beginning and a middle and an end, and they were single titles. And you know what I realized? If I wrote about stuff that made me mad, I was a better writer. So I wrote Wish Tree during the throes of the last presidential election, very quickly, and I couldn't believe how mean we were being to each other. We weren't listening to each other. We were othering entire groups of people. We were being so unkind, and I wanted to talk about it, but I decided to use a tree as my main character, a talking tree, uh, an old oak tree, because I wanted something to look at humans from the outside, and that seemed like the best way to do it. When I wrote Crenshaw, which is about a giant, uh, invisible black cat who loves to eat purple jelly beans, I was interested in talking about hunger and homelessness. One in five kids in our country is hungry sometimes, and I wanted to talk about that, but I wanted to do it um, I had an ulterior motive. I really wanted to write about this giant cat. And I had an old movie that I love that like three people remember called Harvey. Does anyone remember Harvey with Jimmy Stewart? And it's about this guy, this man, whose best friend is, is a giant invisible rabbit called a puka. So that was where I got that idea. But again, I was writing about stuff I cared about, you know? I wrote Home of the Brave, which is about a Sudanese refugee in Minnesota because I was living in Minnesota at the time, and um, these people were coming from S Central Africa, uh, Sudan in that area actually, and um, they were coming to the US, and they had never spoken English, and they had never been in a school, and they didn't know anything about food or customs or anything else, but on top of that, they had to deal with cold and snow. They had never seen snow. And I wrote this during one of the most miserable winters in Minnesota I think they've ever had. And it was like, you know, 40 below with no wind chill. And I thought, how brave is it to come from this whole different place and remake yourself and to have to deal with all that other stuff? Like, what the heck is snow? So I wanted to talk about that. And um, because I cared about it, I think it was a better book. I wrote The One and Only Ivan for the same reason. You may know The One and Only Ivan was based on a true story about a gorilla named Ivan, and that is Ivan on the left. He was a baby then, and he had just at that point been plucked from what is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo and sent to, of all places, Tacoma, Washington. And this guy, this guy who owned a mall, ordered this pair of gorillas like you would order a pair of shoes. It was that easy. And sadly, it still is because poaching is a huge problem. We think Ivan's whole family was probably killed. And these two babies, uh, Burma, the one on the right, may in fact have been a twin. We're not really sure. But the two of them were put in a box and the box got lost and eventually it made its way to Tacoma. And by the time she got there, Burma was really sick. And she died almost as soon as she got there, but Ivan went on to live like a human. And this was his bizarre life. He 
for about three and a half years, lived in this house, and it, they had an eight-year-old boy at the time, so Ivan slept in the same bed with this eight-year-old boy every single night. Can you imagine sleeping with a baby gorilla? How bizarre is that? And Ivan uh, learned to wear human clothes, and he went to McDonald's, and he held babies, and he went to baseball games, and he rode motorcycles, and he could open the fridge. He liked to drink uh, things like Diet Pepsi, so they would hold out his lower lip and pour Pepsis in all day. He liked sugar-free gummy bears. He liked to watch cartoons, and that was his bizarre life for three and a half years. But it turns out if you feed baby gorillas, they get bigger. And when they get bigger, they get stronger. And a full-grown silverback has literally the strength of eight men. So Ivan, one night, uh, they left him alone for about five minutes, and he tore an entire sofa apart. And they realized it was time for their secret plan, which was to put him in the mall. And Ivan sat in this crummy mall. It was in... Um, it's kind of a seedy neighborhood, and it had a carousel, and it had uh, cotton candy, and they sold used tires, and they had a chicken who could play tic-tac-toe, don't ask me how. Um, they had a seal, and the seal ate pennies that people threw into the waiting pool, and she died. I mean, it was, it was not a nice place. But in the middle of it, they built this giant, uh, by the standards of the rest of the mall, not by real life, um, enclosure into which they put Ivan. And Ivan sat there for 27 years, almost three decades without another gorilla. And they painted the jungle on the wall as if that would somehow make up for uh, everything he had lost. And they gave him a little black and white TV, and they gave him a chair, and that was it for 30 years almost. And Ivan seemed to really hate men, but he liked kids a lot. So when kids came to visit, he would run up to that glass and he would high five them and the kids would run for cover. And um, he liked to roll up poop and throw it at them. That was one of his favorite things to do. That's a very common primate uh, in, a, in a captive situation, a primate behavior. And that was his life. But here's what's cool about it. Kids like you got really mad. And they said, this is no way to treat a wild animal. And they told their moms and dads to boycott them all. That means to stop going. They wrote letters to the editor and to the mayor and to the governor. And they stood in front of the mall with big signs. And Ivan, after almost 30 years, was released to Zoo Atlanta. And I always tell kids, there are good zoos and there are really bad zoos. And a good zoo works on species preservation, and they take really good care of their animals, and Ivan was lucky enough to go to a good zoo. So he got there, and he had to learn how to be a gorilla again. And he was always, um, I never actually got to meet him myself, but I got to know his zookeeper very well, and he was always a little quirky. He had a girlfriend named Kenyani, who was in the book, and Kenyani and he had a really iffy relationship, and he had a little toy piano, little, you know, like wooden toy piano, and he uh, got really mad at her one day, and he climbed in a box and hid and waited for her, and then when she walked by, he jumped out of the box and hit her over the head with the piano, because that was Ivan's idea of a practical joke, apparently, and he loved clothes, which, of course, is not a gorilla thing. Somebody brought in a sombrero, a big old hat, and Ivan put it on his head, and he wore it all day, and the other gorillas were like, dude, we don't do that here. We're gorillas. And um, he got tired of it, so he ate the middle of it and wore it like a necklace. And that was just, that was Ivan. But the great thing was, to me, it was this, we saw humans at their absolute worst in the way they treated this poor animal, and then at their best in the way they tried to, to turn his life around. And that made me really, really happy. I almost gave up on Ivan. And this little piece of paper is on my desk. It says, my problem here is, am I giving up on Ivan or not? This was from a journal. And I decided halfway through Ivan that I was going to throw the manuscript away. Um, because who would, in his right mind, would read a book about a gorilla written from the point of view of a gorilla, no less. And when you hear that voice in your head, when you guys are writing, that's your inner editor. And she or he is so annoying. And you are allowed to say shut up to this. That's the only time you can say shut up. You can say shut up to your inner editor because 
that little voice is telling you you're not good enough and and your friends will laugh at you and this is going to be it. You're a lousy writer. Your sister's a better writer. Or, you know, go do something else. No, don't listen to that voice because that is the voice that almost made me give up on Ivan. And then it went on to win a Newbery and now it's being made into a movie. The one and only Ivan has added Helen Mirren to the cast. The 72-year-old actress will work alongside Danny DeVito and Angelina Jolie on Disney's live-action CG hybrid adaptation of Catherine Applegate's acclaimed book. Production work for the film started earlier this week, but Disney is remaining tight-lipped about the character details for the time being. So I almost threw this thing away. And a couple of months ago, I was in London watching them film it. And Danny DeVito is playing Bob the dog, and Helen Mirren is a poodle, and Angelina Jolie is producing it and playing Stella the elephant, and it's going to come out next summer. And I almost threw it away. So what's the moral of that story? Maybe hang in there. When things are hard, don't give up. Just try different ways to go at the problem. And it's not just about writing. It's about everything. Um, so I'm really anxious to see it. I don't know if it'll be any good, but it'll be really fun to see. It's going to be like CGI, like Jungle Book. So the animals will be computer generated, and then it will have, you know, actual actors. So who do you think is the biggest enemy of uh, gorillas like Ivan? Do you think it's cheetahs or elephants or who do you think is an enemy of gorillas? Anybody? You can yell it. Poachers and humans, yes, yes, us. We are the big enemy of gorillas, unfortunately. And when a species keeps getting, uh, we keep seeing losses, eventually they become what is called endangered. And when you get down to one last endling and the endling dies, you're extinct. So we have so many species. I'm just showing you a few, and I'm not even including the, the insects and the plants. Tigers are endangered, the whooping crane, the blue whale, the Asian elephant, the sea otter, eastern and western gorillas, the Tasmanian devil, the orangutan, wild uh, water buffalo, the red wolf, all endangered. And that is just a tiny fraction of what we're dealing with right now. And when a species is gone, it's extinct, and we've lost things like the dodo and the passenger pigeon and the California grizzly bear. We still have grizzly bears, by the way, but this is called a subspecies, and this subspecies is gone forever. So what can we do? Well, there are a lot of things, and some of these I bet you're already doing, and I bet you've talked about them at school. One of the biggest problem with species loss is habitat, and that has to do with things like global warming. So Easy stuff, turn off the lights, recycle, pick up trash. I never do this one, I admit it. Unplug electronics, switch to different bulbs, use both sides of paper, volunteer, take shorter showers. I'm not really good at that one either. Uh, bike more. And when you do these simple things, sometimes it helps species return. And this is one of my favorite success stories, the manatee. I, I don't know if you've ever seen one. They call them sea cows, and they are like the ugliest cute you've ever seen. They are big and they are slow and they were getting hit by boat propellers, particularly in like Florida waterways. And some bright person said, hey, what if the boat slowed down and went a different way? And there are many other things we've done to help them, but they've started to come back. And swans are starting to come back and bald eagles are starting to come back. And that happens when we start changing the way we behave. So the other idea I think is really great I've been encouraging kids who are interested in, in species preservation, pick one. Become the school expert. You become the person who knows everything there is to know about uh, mountain gorillas. It doesn't have to be a cute, fuzzy baby like that, though. Maybe you're interested in armadillos. They're not in the U.S., but in other places, they're endangered. Find a species you care about and learn about it. Go to the library, this library. Uh, go to your bookstore, talk to your teachers, and there's so much you can find out. And the more you learn, the more you can figure out how to raise money for them, how you can make changes in your own behavior. There's a million different things you can do to help. And one of the things I've found most reassuring about doing this tour for Endling is 
I get really depressed about this stuff sometimes. And then I meet you guys. And you are so creative and inspiring and energetic and smart. And I know that if anybody is going to change the world, it's going to be people like you. So what about my Endling Dairn? Poor Bix, what happens to her? I don't know. I haven't written the last book. If you have any suggestions, please let me know. <laughs> I'll give you my email. But in the meantime, I'll show you a little video that tells you what's happened so far. Welcome to the kingdom of Nadara, a world once ruled by six great governing species, Darens, Felivets, Natites, Terramints, Raptidons, and Humans. Now it is controlled by a tyrannical ruler and is on the brink of war, but a group of unlikely allies may change everything. Our heroine and leader of the group is Bix. She's a Darren and may just be the last of her kind, an endling. The Darrens, often mistaken for dogs, are elegant mammals who walk upright with glissaires that allow them to glide through the air. They have pouches, incredibly silky fur, and are as clever as humans. They are loyal to their pack, and their great gift is that they can tell when someone is lying. Then we have Tobble. He is a wobbick, a big-eared creature that most closely resembles a fennec fox. Well, if a fox had three tails. While a wobbick may not be one of the great governing species, don't be fooled. These creatures may seem small in stature, but they're brave beyond measure. Next, we have Gambler, a felivet. Felivets have long tails, thick coats, and breathtaking speed. They can be dangerous with sharp claws and feared jaws. While often mistrusted as brutal hunters, they can be very powerful allies. Rounding out our group, we have Renzo and Kara, the humans. Humans in Nadara are considered the most dangerous creature of all. But there are some that can be trusted. Renzo is an accomplished thief with some magic talent. And then there's Kara. She's kind, smart and strong enough to keep this group together. Now in Endling 2, the first. The group must journey north to the snow-covered mountains of Drayland to help save their kingdom and all the creatures who live in it. You notice she didn't tell you what happens. That's because I don't know what happens yet. So, and this is a really, really, really fun part of writing is you don't always know. There are two kinds of writers. Um, there are outliners who know every last detail, and then there are what we call pantsers, seat of the pants. Flying by the seat of your pants is an old-fashioned expression. It means you don't really know. You're just going to, you know, hope for the best. And um, pantsers don't have any idea how a book's going to end. So I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. My husband is a pantser, and it's really annoying to live with a writer who's a pantser because he's like, yeah, it'll be fine. And I'm like, I don't know. So I'm sure I will think of a good ending, and you you will be the first to know about it. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions? We have a microphone or two, and you can ask me anything. What it's like to be a writer. What it's like to be a gorilla. <laughs> Where did you come up with the idea of super soft fur? You know, I had to think, that's a really good question, because I needed to think about why would people be killing a species? And so often, we hurt species because there's something we humans think might be useful. And sometimes there isn't even that. You know, this is, this is bizarre, but one of the reasons gorillas uh, used to be killed was because people would take their hands after they killed them and turn them into ashtrays for cigarettes. Isn't that bizarre? And that's the kind of weird stuff. Whoa. Siri decided to join the conversation. I don't like this watch. It's supposed to be on, uh, on uh, do not disturb. It's basically turned out to be a glorified pedometer. Does anyone have one of these? <laughs> Maybe it's just me. Um, so what I found was that um, Adding that little dimension, but especially the part about being able to tell the truth. I mean, come on. That would make a lot of people scared. If you're a bad guy, you know what? You don't want anyone around who can tell the truth. Yeah. My question is, uh, a lot of the names in the book series, they sound sort of like... I was wondering how you came up with the names, if there was like a pattern. Um, you know, that is really fun. Um, sometimes, this is a fun idea. If you can't think of a weird name, um, 
go to a foreign language dictionary and pick bits and pieces. Um, sometimes I do it that way, sometimes I combine names. Uh, for baby names in the old days, before we had the internet, I used to have a stack of baby name books like this high. And now you know what I do, I should warn you. I collect names when I'm signing books because a lot of times kids will have really cool names and I add those to my mental list. So there are a lot of ways to do it. I want to be a writer when I grow up. Yay! Um, do you have any tips? Well, first of all, let me ask you this. Have you ever written a story? I'm currently writing one in my house. Then you're a writer. You don't want to be a writer. You're already a writer. And everyone in here who has ever written a story is an author. You don't have to publish. That's really cool. That's really fun. You get to do stuff like this. But I became a writer in fourth grade when I wrote a story about a pig named Alice. And that's all I remember. But, and I didn't even like to read, but I, I wrote stories. So... The main thing I think you need to remember when you're writing is to write from your heart for yourself. Now, when you're in school, your teacher's going to teach you lots of important things about how to write, and that's very important. But when you're home and you've got a journal in front of you or a laptop or just a piece of paper and a pencil, you write what you want to write, and you don't have to show it to a soul. It's yours. It belongs to you. And that is the most important thing. We, I, I have second graders ask me how to get published. And um, unfortunately, there's been a spate of like 18-year-olds getting seven-figure advances. We hate those people. And, <laughs> and kids are getting the idea that this is how it works. No, you have to suffer for your art. <laughs> so, no, you got to write what you love. And um, that is the most important thing. And it's fun. It's supposed to be fun. Remember that. How did you like come up with in which tree there is these like people and how did you like figure out how they met and yeah. That's a good question. That's a really, well, you know what I did? Remember I told you when I wrote The One and Only Ivan, I got halfway through and went, uh-oh, I have a problem. Writers like to call that writer's block because we're very whiny and obnoxious and narcissistic and we're very melodramatic. And it's like, oh, I have writer's block. You don't get to have student block, and teachers don't get to have teacher block. When you are stuck in a story, it just means you have a problem. So my problem with wish tree is exactly what you asked about. I had this tree, cool idea, right? And then I went, uh-oh, trees don't move. How am I going to have a plot? And then I realized, how about if I add, um, if I consider the tree more of a community? Because trees have residents, don't they? They have um, crows and owls, and nearby they might have skunks and opossums. And once I started adding all these creatures, I had a whole community to help me with my plot. So sometimes you get halfway through a story and then you figure out what you need. Do you have a favorite book that you've written? Would you ask your parents who their favorite child was? No, <laughs> you would not do that because they might give you the wrong answer. Um, no, I always say my favorite book is the one I've just finished because I'm so relieved that I'm done. Um, but Wish Tree and Ivan and Enling were, have all been really special to me, I think because they were about things I really cared about. Who taught you how to write? Oh, you know who taught me how to write? Books taught me how to write. And if you want to be a writer, you read and you read and you read. The most important thing you can do, you don't have to ever have anyone help you with your writing if you read a lot because that's where you learn how people do it and you read a book and then you read it one time for fun and then you go back and you read it again and an interesting exercise for aspiring writers that I found really to be helpful um, that someone taught me a long time ago is read a book and get so you know it well first and then sit down and write it verbatim word for word as look over and then write a sentence and ask yourself why why was that choice made? And you write it like it's your own book. And just putting those words down makes it seem possible that you too could write a story like that. And it's very helpful because you learn a lot. In Endling, why do most of the Darren's names have X's in them? 
I have no idea. <laughs> I started thinking, that is so observant. You must be a very careful reader. Very good. I, I think I thought I was going to have them all have excess in their name. And then I realized I was going to run out of names, and, and I, I don't know. Sometimes just weird stuff shows up in your books, and, you know, and we give authors more credit than they really do. I had, um, when I wrote Animorphs, I had this very cult-like fan base who loved these books, and they're all grown up now and breeding. And, you know, they, I had somebody come up recently with a baby, and they named the baby after one of my characters, and I was no, you're, you're still eight years old. You can't be, because um, apparently I've aged too. But Annabelle or somebody went online and in a spirit of love and not um, humor, I hope, um, created a website called KASU and it stood for Catherine Applegate Screw-Ups. And it was all the times that my husband and I had forgotten morphs or messed up our story because when you write a book a month, you make a lot of mistakes. So sometimes we writers just do silly things and we don't even know why. <laughs> what inspired you to make the stories? You know, um, I really, really, really like putting words on paper. I don't actually like the plotting very much, but when I write a pretty sentence, I feel really happy. And that, to me, is the very best part of writing. I think I'm a frustrated poet. Um, but the other best part is that I get to meet people like you, and I get to talk to kids, and I get to, to, to think about ideas in new ways. And that's, that's a pretty cool job, you gotta admit. Should we do, how about two more questions? What do you like about being an author? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, you want to know what I don't like? I pretty much every single day when I have sit down to write, it's hard. You, I mean, you're sitting, you're all by yourself, right? So no one is telling you to do it. And then you uh, stare at that blank page or that empty page on your laptop, and you are scared for a minute. But then when you start putting the words down, it's like you've created a whole nother world. And that is really fun and exciting. The other best part, really, when, I'm, when I have a kid bring a book up to me and say, I really love this story, and I get to sign it to them, oh, that is the best. That's really the best. And this will be our last question. You know, I can't believe that I'm speaking to you right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so cool. <laughs> you know, whenever I uh, actually uh, take a paper and put it down, I'm like, what do I want to write? <laughs> I think I'm going to write a story, but when I put down the paper, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to write. So I just yes. come up with a quick idea and start talking. Dotting down things, and yes. it's just that I usually just I just write a few things down and quit and get over well, it. Did, it did, how do you how do you um how do you get through that and how do you stop the feeling from wanting to quit? Because that's what I wanted to ask oh, you right now. Oh, you are such a writer. You are so going to be a writer. The very fact that you asked that question tells me that you're a writer. And that is okay. You just heard me talk about how scared I was to make mistakes and my annoying inner editor in my head. That's what's happening to you. Your inner editor is getting in the way. And there are lots of fun tricks you can do when that happens. Have you like Free writing is one that lots of people do. You probably tried that where... You know, you write as fast as you can, and you don't worry about periods, and you don't worry about capitalization, and you don't worry about making sense, and you just start writing, and you go, I hate myself, I can't write it, blah, 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 this is the worst story ever, blah, 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 blah. And pretty soon, you're so tired of writing silly stuff that maybe you even start writing actual ideas. Or you can switch genres. Sometimes you're writing a story in a, a way that's maybe, maybe not, your brain just want to go there. So write some poetry or write a picture book, or switch gears and write uh, something with entirely different characters. Sometimes you just have to switch. It is okay to take a story and put it in timeout. I have a book in timeout right now. It's like a, a really obnoxious toddler. It is not behaving. It was due about a year ago. And I got, I, I, was, I thought I had it. And then I, I went to my publisher and said, you know what? 
this needs more time. And sometimes you put that story in time out and you just go do something else for a while and then you go back and you go, hey, there's some pieces here I like. There's some diamonds in with the coal. And then you start writing again. But the most important thing is to not listen to all those different voices and just to write because you love it. Because clearly you're going to be a writer. You might as well just admit it now and have fun with it because it's so much fun. Sometimes it helps to write with a friend. I know a lot of people who do that. I've collaborated with my husband and we're still married. But... Um, you can find a friend who likes to write, and maybe, or maybe someone who wants to illustrate your stories. And that kind of gives you support. So there are millions of tricks. Um, but the main thing is um, keep writing. And when you have a day and it's just not going to happen, read a book instead. And maybe that will inspire you. That's such a good last question to end on because there are so many writers in this room. You're already writers because you're writing stories. But some of you are going to be published writers too. And... It is absolutely the best job in the world. I, teaching's nice, and librarians are nice, but oh man, writing is the best. So I want you guys to do one more thing for me before we go sign, and that is give yourselves a huge round of applause because you've been such a lovely audience.